Good morning, everyone. Actually, by the time you get this, it will be evening, but happy Monday. I hope you've had a great day so far. My name is Stephanie. Welcome to Get Ready With Me and Talk About Stuff, the show where I talk about whatever is on my mind while I put on my makeup. Um, it's not really about the makeup. It's just basically giving me something to do, but if you enjoy makeup and you enjoy talking about random topics, this show might be for you. If you are a regular regularly tuning in and you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button, like, share the video, invite more people to the party. If you're new here, welcome. I hope that you enjoy visiting with me today and you find the show interesting and fun. So today we are going to be talking about someone who I came across while I was um, looking for vintage photos of people who presented as non-binary. Um, I've gotten into this thing lately where I find vintage, because I love the vintage aesthetic, and I find vintage photos that I like and I draw them. And sometimes I pair them with a Bible verse um, that is meant to be ironic and funny. <laughs> and other times I just draw them because I think they're interesting. And that was um, certainly the case with the person we're going to be talking about today, Gladys Bentley. Do you Have you heard of Gladys Bentley? I had not until I came across her amazing picture and drew her and then started reading up on her. So let's get into this. Um, Gladys Bentley was born August 12, 1907 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to George and Mary Bentley. She went, she, um, from the time she was a baby, she had a strained relationship with her mother. In fact, um, Gladys wrote later in her life, when they told my mother she had given birth to a girl, she refused to touch me. She wouldn't ever nurse me, and my grandmother had to raise me for six months on a bottle before they could persuade my mother to take care of her own baby. So right out of the gate, Gladys Bentley is... She's got, a, she's got issues with her mom. Um, her mom decided early on that Gladys was not the child she wanted, and she was treated accordingly, unfortunately. Now, Gladys was the oldest of four children. Um, Gladys went through her entire childhood always feeling unwanted and rejected. She had brothers, so her mother um, finally got the boys she wanted and treated Gladys you know, she treated her as a problem. She treated her as a child. She would just prefer not be around. Now, as Gladys got older, um, one of the things that she did sort of as vengeance um, against her mother and also kind of some retaliation against her brothers, even though from what I can tell her brothers, they were just, they were children. They didn't really have anything to do with what was happening to Gladys, but understandably Gladys was angry she would start wearing their clothes. Now what ended up happening is she found that the clothes were very comfortable for her. Gladys, from the time she was very small, she was of a larger build. And what she realized was that her brother's clothing felt more comfortable on her body than the clothing that her mother preferred she wear. You know, the little dresses and, you know, frilly shirts and stuff. And so her gender nonconformity began at a very young age. Now, she was teased for this at school and her mother obviously took issue with it. She, you know, Bentley would later recall that not only was she dressing in clothes that were, you know, defined as for boys, but she also recalled that she had a crush, well, what she would later understand was a crush, on a, you know, one of her elementary school teachers. She didn't know what the what she was experiencing at the time. She just knew that she had an infatuation with this teacher, and she always wanted to be around her. Um, she would have dreams about her. You know, she just knew that whatever, for whatever reason, she really wanted to be around this teacher all the time. Now, as Gladys got older, her behavior was seen as abnormal and unladylike. Um, her mother obviously was displeased that she was wearing her brother's clothing. 
she was displeased that Gladys just did not fit the gender norms in any way whatsoever. And in response to that, her mother, and I, I didn't hear a lot, read a lot about where her father was during all of this. I'm guessing with four children and a wife to take care of, he was probably working a lot. Um, Gladys's family was very poor, and I imagine that her father spent most of his time working to try to keep a roof over their heads. So her mother, though, really felt that Gladys needed to be, she needed fixing. She needed to, whatever was wrong with her that was causing her to prefer boys' clothing and present herself in such an, an unfeminine manner, her mother thought, you know, there's something wrong with my child. This needs to be fixed. This is an embarrassment. So they sent Gladys to a doctor to have her fixed. She would actually end up seeing about six different doctors to fix what they perceived as a problem. Her gender nonconformity was definitely considered an issue that needed to be dealt with. Um, she was, you know, later on, Gladys would say that if they had to give her a label, it would be called extreme social maladjustment. But at the time, they just, they said, you know, this is a problem we've got to fix. And they would give her vitamins in an effort to help her become more, I don't know, I guess more ladylike. I didn't know that came in a, in a vitamin, but that's what they believed at the time. But still, she was unable to conform to what her parents wanted of her. Um, the fact of the matter was, she was more comfortable in boys' clothing. She did not want to present herself in a in a lady, you know, a quote, ladylike manner. Um, she preferred to live her life the way she was living it, and her family could not accept that. So when Gladys was 16 years old, she left home. And where did she go? She went to Harlem. Now in Harlem, she found a very welcoming environment. She arrived in Harlem in the uh, at the height of the Harlem Renaissance, which you know gave the world music and dance that had it had never seen before. Um, and she showed up just in time to really dive into that. When she got there, she had heard through the grapevine that. Harry Hansberry's Clam House, one of the city's most gay, notoriously gay speakeasies, needed a male pianist. Now, prior to this, um, I didn't put it in my notes, but prior to this, she had been working at a club performing in drag. And, well, let me, let me rephrase that. She would wear like a suit, coat, and a shirt, and then she'd wear a skirt. So she wasn't in drag yet. But she would present herself at, at these clubs in a very masculine manner. And she her, her voice became well known. I mean, she was very popular. Her performances were, uh, you know, they were a favorite of the crowd. And one of the reasons for that is her unique voice. And I've included a playlist in the description so you can hear it for yourself. But her voice was very unique. She had a wide range. And she could also do this amazing thing with her voice where she could literally sound like a trumpet. And I listened to that for myself. And I was like, wow, that she's doing that with her voice. That's amazing. So, but after she'd been at this club for a while, she had heard about this other club, um, Harry Hansberry's Clam House. One of the most, as I said, one of the city's most notorious gay speakeasies. And they were, she heard that they were in need of a pianist and they wanted a male pianist. And upon hearing this, Gladys thought, well, you know what? This is the perfect time for them to hire a woman. And what she ended up doing was she showed up in full drag. You know, she, she presented, um, she dressed like a man and she went there and she, um, uh, auditioned for the, for the, uh, job. And she not only was given the job, she was once again, given her own show. And she took that show and she perfected it. She performed, um, on stage as Barbara Bobby Minton. And she, she was so successful in her show that they ended up renaming the club 
um, Barbara's Exclusive Club after her stage name. She um, did so well with her show. She had started out at the club getting, um, let's see, $35 a week plus tips, which at that time isn't terrible. But by the time she reached like the peak of her career at that club, she was getting $125 a week plus tips. Her show was so successful and her reputation was so, so well known that she would eventually begin touring and she went all over the United States with this um, act that she did as Bobby Minton and she, people just loved her and it didn't matter, you know, Black people, white people, straight people, gay people, people just loved her. And she ended up, um, she moved on to another club. I think it's the, I don't know how to pronounce this. And I should have looked it up. I'm sorry. It's spelled U-B-A-N-G-I club. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I feel like I'm going to do it badly. Um, I don't know. I don't even know where to go with that. But anyway, so her, she moved on to that club on Park Avenue, and that is when things really took off for her. I mean, she was making so much money. She ha she was able to afford. Now, this is a queer black woman in the United States. Um, she her she was so successful. She could afford a three hundred dollar a month apartment on Park Avenue. She had a nice car. She had a domestic staff. She toured the country with destinations including like Cleveland, Chicago, Hollywood. She was well liked by celebrities like Cesar Romero, Cary Grant, Barbara Stanwyck. I mean, this is a level of success that. She would never have known if she hadn't left home. And she certainly, um, you know, as a black queer woman in the United States, I mean, that is not a level of success at the time, you know, that, that most people would have expected. But she did it, and she did it very well. So passing, she had great talent as a singer, a piano player. Her performances were called comical, sweet, and risque. She did not make any... She didn't mince any words whatsoever. The audience knew she was a woman. They knew she was a lesbian. That was really part of her show. She would sing these songs that were um, sexually charged. You know, she didn't mind writing and, and singing songs about sexual relationships. She would flirt with the women in the audience. Um, she would sing about, quote, sissies and bulldaggers and, you know, either in through innuendo or in very little literal terms she would sing about her female lovers I mean nobody was you know it was very uh unambiguous <laughs> she did not hide at all who she was and people loved her for it she she didn't feel that she needed to hide now at this time in in the United States I mean it was still a risk to be openly gay much more so than it is now. Um, but this is also during the Prohibition era. And, and during that era, a lot of people were just kind of, you know, anything goes. It's all good. If that's who you are, just be who you are. It's all fine. It's all good. Um, live your life. Now, she mostly played the blues and parodies of popular songs. And she... It is said that she was mocking high-class imagery with, quote, low-class humor, and she applied aspects of the sexually charged, quote, black blues to demure romantic white ballads, creating a culture clash between these two music forms. And that was, that was what she, that was what she was known for, and that was what her audience wanted when they would go to see her, because she really challenged for them the idea of you know, ideas about uh, class, about race, about sexuality. She was really challenging so many norms. And she did it in such a way that was so entertaining and so funny and so engaging with people that they didn't even realize, I don't, I don't think they even realized what, what was happening as they were sitting at her show. They just knew that they really loved what she was doing. Um, 
I skipped something here. Oh yeah, so she was known for taking popular ballads and putting a humorous, promiscuous spin on them. Now I especially, I found that bit of information especially lovely because I like to take Bible verses and put a, put a suggestive spin on them. Um, one of the things that I do, and one of the reasons, you know, one of the ways I came across her picture was I not only take my Bible and redact it to create unique poetry, but I also take um, pictures, uh, as I mentioned earlier, vintage pictures, redraw them with a few changes so that they better fit what I'm trying to present, and pair them with Bible verses so that the outcome is uh, mildly or very directly <laughs> sexual. So when I read that about her, I thought, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I think I love her. So in 1928, she signed a deal with OK, is it OKA? OKEH Records, and she recorded eight sides, which means uh, four records, you know, eight sides, side A and side B, um, over the course of the next year. And in 1929 and 1930, she also recorded with the Washboard Serenaders for Victor Records, and she recorded for the Excelsior and Flame labels. So her career really took off. She presented something so unique, not just with her appearance, but with her sound, with her whole presentation. She was giving people something they weren't finding anywhere else, and she was true to who she was, and that allowed her to achieve enormous success, especially through the Prohibition era. So, um, again, as I mentioned, her vocal range was it was, um, she had a, a wide vocal range. She could, excuse me, my goodness, I am so sorry. Um, you know, her, her style was loud and deep, but she could also hit the high notes. And as I mentioned, she could literally make her voice sound like a trumpet. And that still blows my mind. I've listened to, to her a few times now. And I, every time she gets to that, I'm just like, oh my gosh, she is doing that with nothing but her voice. This this was long before the days of auto-tune and, and anything else that would have made it possible for her to appear as if she's doing it with her voice, but it's really something else. This was all her, and she did it so well that she was just everywhere she went. People loved her, um, and it didn't matter. Like I said, gender, gender didn't matter. Race didn't matter. Sexuality didn't matter. People just loved Gladys Bentley. Now, when the Prohibition era ended and speakeasies, you know, fell into decline because there was no reason for them anymore. You didn't need a speakeasy anymore when you could just, you know, you could just openly consume alcohol and not have to worry about who might find out. So, speakeasies fell by the wayside and Gladys uh, found herself in a situation where her opportunities um, kind of fell away along with the speakeasies. There was just no place really for her to go at that point in Harlem. So what did she do? She moved out to California. Now when she moved to California, um, she tried to maintain what she'd been doing all along. She was billed as the, oh, how do they, the America, America's greatest sepia tone piano, or I'm sorry, America's greatest sepia piano player. And they also referred to her as the brown bomber of sophisticated songs. They really put a lot of emphasis on her race, which from what I can tell up to that point had not been the focus of her popularity. But once she moved out to California, um, she had to market herself a little bit differently. And that is what, what happened with her. So she would perform in a number of, um, where's my brush? I'm sorry. I forgot to get out this brush and now I can, there it is. So she would perform in a number of gay night spots, but she didn't achieve the same success she had in the past. And as time progressed, unfortunately, laws changed and it actually became dangerous for her to 
um, do what she'd done all along. She was told she would have to carry a special license to perform in men's clothing. Um, it be it would become very dangerous for her to be openly lesbian. At this time in, in history, a person who is openly gay, they could lose their job. They could lose their housing. They could be thrown in jail. They could, um, in Gladys's case, because of the industry she was part of, she could be very easily be blackballed by that industry and her work opportunities would just disappear. Um, you know, things changed a lot for Gladys in California as the laws changed. Now, she was frequently harassed for dressing in men's clothing. Now, because of a lot of things are going on here. So she, she performed in drag, yes. But off stage, she also dressed in men's clothing because she just found them more comfortable. They were, you know, she was a larger woman. And just as she had been a larger child, she was a larger woman. She would say later that at her largest, she weighed around 400 pounds. So this was not a small, petite woman who, you know, for whom the fashion industry would make clothing that was comfortable. And that is still true today. There are still a lot of um, people in women's fashion who don't understand that, you know, some women are not built for the styles that are clearly designed for these tiny sizes, these petite sizes. And, you know, a lot of women who are of a larger build are left with very few comfortable clothing options. It was, you know, that was... Gladys's experience. So not only was she dressing in drag on stage, she was also wearing men's clothing in her day-to-day -day life. And she received a lot of, um, a lot of harassment for that. Now, again, she was openly lesbian early in her career. Um, she, in 1931, married a white woman in Atlantic City. But as things began to change in the public perception of homosexuality and I think you know with the end of the prohibition era suddenly people became a lot more conservative all of a sudden the things that had been you know permissible during the prohibition era suddenly were beginning to be scrutinized much more because you know people I guess always need something to complain about and they chose homosexuality as their pet cause I suppose um, so because of this it was becoming dangerous for Gladys to live her life as she had. So even though, you know, when she was in Harlem and even early in her California days, um, she was openly lesbian. As things changed, she realized that if she was going to have any viability whatsoever, she was going to have to change how she presents herself. So she started wearing dresses and presenting herself in a more traditionally feminine manner, and she also would marry. Um, she married, let's see, who was the first? Who was the first? Oh. Okay, so here it is. So she married a man named J.T. Gibson, who would end up passing away in 1952, and then in 1952, she also, she married Charles Roberts, who she would end up divorcing five months later. Um, and, you know, Charles Roberts, <laughs> he denied ever, ever having married her at all. But this was all an effort to protect herself, to protect her livelihood, to protect her marketability. And she would take this to such you know, sadly, to such extremes that she would, in 1952, write a piece for Ebony Magazine called I Am a Woman Again, in which she would discuss steps she had taken to rid herself of something she considered to be uh, basically kind of a curse. She said in the um, article, which I did provide a link to in the description, that she had taken 
hormones and she'd had a procedure done. She didn't say what the procedure was. And out of respect for her, because she did not choose to disclose it, I really didn't feel that it would be right for me to go digging into it to figure out what she had done. But she had, she said she had an operation done to cure her of the, you know, supposed evil desires she was experiencing and had experienced most of her life. And she essentially was subjected to a conversion therapy. That's what we would call it today. I mean, she was, she had an operation done. She was counseled. She was given hormones, um, all in an effort to, uh, ungay her, I guess. Now the sad part to me is in the article, she speaks of her life as, um, you know, her life in Harlem and her early days in California as days of uh, sinfulness, I suppose, because of her lesbian relationships and her choice to perform in drag. And she speaks about her conversion therapy and the results as if they were the greatest miracle she's ever experienced. The sad part is, even as she's writing this, so this was this was written early in her marriage to um, Charles Roberts. Even as she's writing this article, she expresses that she isn't sure that she'll be able to resist the desires that she's had her whole life. Despite saying right in the article, it's a miracle, I've been cured, etc., She's at the same time saying, um, I hope this is the cure that I need. I hope this is going to do what I intend for this therapy to do. Because if it doesn't, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my marriage and I'm going to lose my life. And as I read the article, I was so saddened by the sense that she, if she wanted to remain a viable entertainer. This was something she had to do. She didn't have a choice. She knew that if she didn't publicly say something about this life that she was leaving behind, and if she didn't publicly assure people that that part of her life was over, um, she knew she was going to stop selling albums. She was not going to get jobs. She knew that you know, her, her life is in the industry, which is all she knew. Um, it was over. So this was something she felt she had to do. And then the, ad additionally, a sad part of it is, um, in the link that I provided for you, you can read some of the, uh, letters from readers that were sent to the editor after her story ran. And there were women who were saying, you know, I've struggled with these same desires and they're horrible and I feel disgusting and I'm so thankful that you wrote this because it gives me hope. You know, they were saying that they they were so disgusted with themselves for having these longings that they would rather be dead than continue to live with them and her story gave them hope that they could find a way to overcome these things. And even a man wrote in and, and thanked her for sharing what she had because he he was homosexual and he was disgusted with himself and he wanted to rid himself of these longings but wasn't sure he could and her her story had given him hope so her story not only served to invalidate herself but it also served to invalidate um a lot of the people who read it now, of course, there were the people who were thrilled that she had written the story for, because, you know, for the reason that they, they agreed with her, that she was absolutely, um, you know, abhorrent as a lesbian and as somebody who would dress in drag and flirt with women from the stage and so forth. But now that she'd been able to let go of that part of herself, well, now everything was fine. And thank you for doing that, Gladys. And we're so glad you wrote about it because maybe now all these other people can uh, get a clue and realize that, hey, they don't have to be gay. 
So there was speculation later on that she had never actually married any man. And as I mentioned, um, her husband that she was married to at the time she wrote the article, he denied ever marrying her. So there are reasons to be somewhat suspicious of what was really going on. What we do know for sure, as I just discussed, is without denouncing her sexuality, she was in a position where her livelihood was going to disappear. So the speculation is that she was never married to any man. She never really changed. Um, you know, this miracle she said happened to her didn't really happen. And she was doing this to appease people. She was doing this to save face publicly. But privately, nothing was different. I don't think that in indicates necessarily that she led a double life. But what it, what people are saying and have been saying for a while is she, those were just words. She was always, she remained as she always had been, just not doing it openly. And she did it to save her, her livelihood. Um, I think it's easy in the position we're in now in 2021 to look at what she did and think, you know, how shallow it was to to write such a harmful article to save, you know, just so you could keep selling albums. But you have to understand, this was all she knew. She didn't have a plan B. So if her album sales and her, her gigs were to dry up to nothing because of her sexuality and her preference for dressing in drag, um... That would have been it. She had nothing to fall back on. So she did this. It was a matter of survival for her. And even in 2021, we all know of people who stay in the closet or go back in the closet because it, their survival depends on it. And I don't think that Gladys was any different. Um, because you can't just not you know you can't just say well i'm not gay anymore um i personally do not believe there are ex-gays i know that there are a lot of christian ministries out there that like to say there are i think what that's actually about is people were either forced back into the closet for the mean for the means of survival because they knew that if they stayed out that the networks they had for support were going to disappear and they really were not in a position where they could afford that. Or these were people who were experimenting sexually, had some same-sex experiences, um, decided to adopt the label of gay for whatever reason, but they were never gay to begin with. They were people who were experimenting and starting to understand their own sexuality and adopted an identity that um, when everything was said and done really didn't jive with who they were. That's my opinion. I don't believe that there are ex-gays. I just don't because I, that's not a part of yourself that you can just decide to change. So Gladys wrote this article. She denounced her sexuality. She, you know, publicly repented for having engaged in, you know, same-sex relationships and dressing in drag and so forth. And she, um, went on to get very involved in her church. She went on to pursue licensing. You know, she wanted to become a licensed minister and that became her life after, at least publicly anyway, after she wrote this article. Now, her marriage, you know, she had been married three times in addition to the, quote, lavender wedding she had in Atlantic City. She had been married three different times um, to various men, and none of her marriages lasted very long at all. Um, her last marriage lasted five months, and she never remarried. She would pass away in 1959. Uh, at the age of 52 and 
she died of uh, pneumonia. Um, at the time of her death, so she would have, she was 59, died in, ni or 52, died in 1959. She had just been licensed as a minister by her church. Um, she had not completed all of her studies yet, but somehow she had been, I don't think getting ordained as a minister even today is all that difficult. I think a lot of people can do it actually. And, you know, she, um, her church gave her a shortcut to getting her ordination, which was something that she, you know, it was important to her. And that had only recently happened before she passed away. So what is her, what is her legacy? I'm going to read this to you, then I'm going to pause to finish my makeup, and then we're going to talk about why this story is so important even today. So her legacy, this I'll just read this quote. It said, aside from her musical talent and success, Bentley is a significant and inspiring figure to the LGBT community and African Americans. And she was a prominent figure during the Harlem Renaissance. She was revolutionary in her masculinity. Differing from the traditional male impersonator or drag king in popular theater, Gladys Bentley did not try to pass as a man, nor did she playfully try to deceive her audience into believing she was biologically male. Instead, she exerted a black female masculinity that troubled the distinctions between black and white and masculine and feminine. That is the legacy of Gladys Bentley. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to share with you why that's important. But for right now, I'm going to pause, finish this up, and I'll come back looking spectacular. All right, I'll be right back. I'm back. So I'm really digging my eye makeup today. I wasn't even sure what I was going to do when I first started putting it on, but it looks amazing. So anyway, Gladys Bentley. Why do we need to talk about Gladys Bentley even today? Um, I think sometimes people think, you know, when you think of Pride Month and you think of the catalysts for it and so forth, I think a lot of people only go so far back as the Stonewall. And it's important to understand that these struggles have been going on much longer. Um, you know, she was, she was persecuted, she was forced into conversion, conversion therapy, basically. Um, even when she was a, she was a child, she was forced to, into a form of conversion therapy. And then because she couldn't comply with the demands, um, her family mistreated her and she ended up having to leave. Same thing still happens today. There are a lot of unhoused youth that are LGBTQ who have been rejected by their families. And this is not a new problem, unfortunately. And Gladys Bentley is but one example of this happening long ago. So we get an idea of really how long this problem has been going on. It's not new. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because people sometimes ask, well, why do we still need a Pride Month? That's why. Because a lot of the problems that Gladys dealt with as a woman, you know, in the 1920s, 1930s, up till her death, those are still going on. Um, you know, just Gladys Bentley is an example of the price that people sometimes have to pay just for being who they are. And unfortunately, it still happens. Now, another issue or another observation, I guess I would say, is Gladys Bentley's life also demonstrates the pressure to perform your gender. Um, she did not perform femininity in the right way, and she was persecuted for it. And that still happens today. Um, women who don't present as being feminine enough, um, you know, who aren't performing it in the right way, are still maligned you know online i get called sir and constantly misgendered all the time because the minute i challenge someone they'll look at my appearance and look at the way i present myself and decide that the most hurtful thing that they can do in their minds is to misgender me 
and, uh, you know, abuse me in a way to, to make me pay for not being feminine in a way that they think is acceptable. So that is also not a new thing. This is also has been going on for a very long time. And I think that what people don't understand, or maybe they do, I don't know, is that when women, regardless of their sexuality, when they are maligned for um, not being feminine enough, and especially when the LGBTQ community does it, and it does happen even within the community, um, it reinforces the very stereotypes that people have worked so hard to, uh, to overcome. You know, we're living in an era now where people are being encouraged to express their gender however they see fit, regardless of what societal expectations might be. The fact still remains, though, that, um, you know, there is a price to pay for not presenting in a way that people, even sometimes people within the LGBTQ community, find acceptable. Now, another thing I want to touch on is the tendency to rewrite history. A few years back, during Black History Month, the New York Times ran uh, rewritten obituaries to honor um, black people, black Americans who had you know, passed away during times that were not as accepting and rewrite the obituary that they felt these people deserved. In the, the obituary they did for Gladys Bentley, she was called, you know, it was said that she was among the first people to embrace a trans identity. First of all, not true. There were people who did it well before her. Um, and not only that, but she never identified as trans. She never said that she was a man. She used feminine pronouns. She never tried to convince anyone that she was anything but a black lesbian woman who preferred to dress and drag. She never made that a secret. So in rewriting her history and calling her trans, that erases her own truth. That erases the fact that, no, she wasn't trans. She was a lesbian. And I think sometimes when a woman presents as masculine, it's assumed she must be trans when really it's just a, a, a woman who identifies as a woman, uses feminine pronouns, knows she's a woman and never, has no problem with that, just prefers to present in a way that is stereotypically more masculine. Um, erasing one part of the community, lesbians in this case, to elevate another part of the community, transgender people in this case, is a disservice to everyone because the whole uh, emphasis of not only Pride Month, but hopefully the LGBTQ community as a whole all year round should be being inclusive and not saying, you know, not gatekeeping, saying you're not this enough or you're not that enough to be called gay or lesbian or whatever. Um, by saying that Gladys Bentley embraced a trans identity, that is completely erasing her own truth. And I've seen this happen before, um, like Prince comes to mind. There have been assertions made that he was non-binary. To my knowledge, he never said that. To my knowledge, and if his songs are any indication, he was very clear on the fact that he was a man, and he just sometimes... Um, bent gender stereotypes with the way he presented himself, but that did not mean that he identified as non-binary. He was very clear on who he was. And to rewrite his history and claim him as non-binary when that's something he never said for himself, it's uh, erasing his truth and it is injecting, um, it, it's, it's inserting a falsehood into the narrative. And it's it's just important that we respect, you know, and it's interesting because during Pride Month especially, we hear a lot about respecting the way people identify, respecting what they say is true about themselves, yet in the case of Gladys Bentley and Prince and countless others, um, once they've passed away, 
that truth gets erased and history gets rewritten. And it's really disrespectful to not only the individuals in question, but everyone who reads it. Because had if Gladys Bentley's story is presented as it actually was, that is very affirming for not just other lesbians, but any woman who presents in a way that is stereotypically considered masculine. It's very affirming to know that there are people who went before her. Their stories maybe did not end the way that we would have liked to see them end. But what it does is it shows that a way was paved for people to, um, you know, more fully embrace their own authenticity. It's tragic that Gladys Bentley's story ended as it did. Um, it's tragic she had to completely deny significant aspects of herself to be considered acceptable. But what that did was it fueled an already simmering rage that led to things like Stonewall, which in turn led to today's greater acceptance of people's truths, how they identify, what their sexuality is, the fact that sometimes those things change, it can all be very fluid. Stories like Grace ben or sorry, Gladys Bentley's um, are important because it shows that the way that was paved to get to where we are today, it was through blood, sweat, and tears. None of this came easily. And the fact that so many of these issues are still issues today, it's still an issue that 16-year-olds have to leave home because their family cannot accept that they are gender non-conforming or they're lesbian or gay or bisexual or whatever. The fact that we're still dealing with these things today indicates, yes, pride is still necessary. There is still work to be done. We have not arrived yet. And it does good to talk about the stories of those who went before us to not only celebrate whatever window of time where they were able to fully be themselves, but also to acknowledge that for all the work that has been done and for all the progress that has been made, we still have a ways to go. And that is why it's important that we have Pride Month. That is why it's important that people share their stories and speak their truth because um, there are still people out there, especially teenagers, who think that they're better off dead than fully embracing and living their truth. And there are still parents out there who think, I'd rather not have my child in my house at all than accept them as part of the LGBTQ community. And, you know, Grace Bentley, uh, I keep calling her Grace, Gladys Bentley is an example of you know, what determination can look like living on your own terms and also sadly an example of what happens when the powers that be will not allow you to do that, at least not with any measure of success and free of any danger. So that's, that's why I felt it was important to share her story. Um, would her story still be as remarkable had she been able to live her truth? Absolutely. Absolutely, but the fact that she wasn't speaks volumes. Conversion therapy is not a new thing. It's gone on way too long. Um, the issue of homeless uh, or unhoused LGBTQ youth is not new. Um, the issue of people forcibly going back into the closet, you know, being forced back into that closet they work so hard to get out of, that is not new. And it's important that we remember that so that we can remember why we need to do what we're doing every June and hopefully year round in sharing our stories and validating the experiences of others. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, after I give you that really <laughs> somber spiel, I hope you enjoyed the video. Wasn't that fun? But really, I hope you did. I hope that you learned some new things. Um, I hope you'll share this video you know, it might help somebody who is feeling confused, feeling like they are alone, feeling that nobody else in the world can possibly understand what it's like to be told you can't live your truth, etc. and so forth. Um, it's a fascinating story and well worth sharing. 
Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. If you did enjoy the video, please share it. Also, I have a question for you. Would it be helpful to you if I were to include in the description the products that I used? Because I used to do that and then I stopped and I'm just wondering if that's something you'd like to see come back. Let me know. I will talk with you again very soon. Have a great rest of your day. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Don't shoot on yourself or anyone else. And stay safe out there. I'll talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye.